Hey, how's it going guys? In today's video, I've got a really cool game to show you. I'm really excited um, about this. Um, it's an opening B3 against the French defense that I absolutely love. And in about 10 moves, um, we get a position where I have three minor pieces versus a queen. My opponent is up two pawns as well. So technically he's up material, but... Three minor pieces can do a lot of damage, even though technically they only add up to nine and a queen and two pawns adds up to 11. Quickly, if you do enjoy the video, please drop a like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. And with that, we'll get into the rest of the game. So d5, the whole point of this opening is to sacrifice the four pawn, get the bishop on this long diagonal and then build up pressure against the pawn to win it back with like knight c3, queen e2, potentially g4, g5 to kick a knight out from f6 that's defending the pawn. It's a really cool opening. So we have this line, queen e2, bishop e7, and I go g4. The computer calls this a miss. I think that's a bit harsh because the reason it does so is because of knight c6. And after g5, knight d4. And the problem with this position is that if I go queen to d1, so my queen's under attack and c2 is under attack, then black's got quite a nice position. This pawn is very weak. And if I play a move like h4 to defend it, black can just take a massive center. He's still up a pawn. If I try and take the pawn back, I mean, what's the suggestion? Just moves like bishop f5. Black is dominating here. Like, these pawns are overextended. My queen is doing nothing. A move like c3 to kick the knight out not only blocks my bishop, but weakens my light squares. So, I instead decide, look, we're going to do this. I'm going to take on f6, and after you take on e2, I take on e7, which attacks the queen meaning that he has to take back, and then I can take the knight, and we have three minor pieces for a queen and two pawns. Now, I've never actually played this line, but I think, I think given the opportunity, I probably will in the future, because it is so cool, especially if I can learn the position. Now, bishop e2 is best here, and I think it's because after f5, you can play f3 in, well, queenside castle first, but maybe you can play f3. I think that's probably why bishop e2 is good. Because the knight, yeah. The knight and the bishop both support the push. The problem with what I did, because I've never seen this position before, I took with the knight. And my logic was that I'll get my bishop out on one of these diagonals. I'll get my rook to the g-file. And the knight can exploit the weak dart squares. But after f5... I realize it's not that simple because if I go somewhere like d4 I'm not really doing anything the knight is just vulnerable to pawn pushes and attacks if I go knight to f4 again it's vulnerable to e5 to g5 not immediately but I'm also not looking at anything I can't go anywhere I need to try and get to e5 but for that I need a knight on c4 and it's very difficult to get to c4. When you have this structure where the knight is like, there's two diagonal spaces between the knight and the square you want it on, it's very difficult to get it there. You'd have to maneuver like, I mean, how would you even do it? You'd have to get to here. So you'd have to play like this, which is one, two, three, four moves, you know? That's that's quite a lot. That's quite a lot. Whereas if I went for the F3 idea and brought my knight there, I'm going to just to E5 straight away. So that was a bit of an oversight. An F5 was a good move. So I queenside castle because my bishop's still strong. This bishop, neither of these diagonals are actually great for it. But maybe it can come to C4 at some point if I can get this knight somewhere. We have bishop D7. I play rook G1. Just because at some point they could team up on the G pawn. My opponent queenside castles. And I go knight f4. 
because I'd like to get this bishop out. We have rook hg8, just adding some extra protection. I go bishop c4 because now this pawn is kind of weak and it potentially, well, if he moves it forward, it's probably bad. Apparently I take here and I'm just up an exchange because if he takes the bishop, I'm going to move my knight. And if he takes my knight, I'm going to move my bishop. Although apparently this is better. Ah, because then Rook's going to take there. Okay. But you get my point. So he goes g5, forcing my knight out, which apparently I should have gone to g2 to go to e3. But that's tough to see because it blocks the Rook. It, it's an unnatural move. And my opponent plays c5. c5 is designed just to stop my knight from coming to d4. But it allows a5, which is the second best move in the position. <clears throat> and I now have a firm grip of this b5 square, which could be quite useful. If my opponent plays something like a6, maybe I have a5? Maybe not right now, but potentially getting a knight in there at some point, which could be very good. So my opponent goes rook g e8, which just really confused me because I don't I didn't understand what it was doing there. This pawn is very well defended. The rook was doing a good job on the g file. It just seemed like an odd move. So I went rook g3 with the intention of punishing my opponent by doubling rooks and trying to bait the move f4, which he plays. Now the reason I do this, I, I literally just bring my rook back, which is the best move. Because now e4 hangs. The f5 pawn was doing a great job of defending it, but with no f5 pawn, e5, e, e, e4 is very fragile. And if e4 falls, then my position starts to come alive. My bishop opens up, and the light squares become weak. My knights can dance around a bit. It looks promising, but bishop c6 defends the pawn for now, and I decide, okay, I'm going to go knight to b5. I'm going to threaten knight takes a7 check, winning this bishop, damaging the structure. I'm also just threatening to win the pawn on a7. I'm going to bring this knight in to c3 and win e4 at some point, and this bishop is now open. In this position, there's... I think there's only three moves. B6 is one, which defends A6 because the queen's defense is opened up. One is A6, where after knight A7 check, king C7, knight takes C6, my opponent has to play king takes C6, which is kind of scary because again, I could go for this whole maneuver and the king looks weak. I could even maybe play the bishop in straight away Although apparently b5, yeah, no, that's true. Actually, b5 is a problem. So a5 or knight c3 help to stop that. But that, that that's a tough line to see. And the other move is just bishop takes, which, of course, I'd be happy to see because I then force his rook to move and I'm going to win this pawn and my bishop's going to open up. And my minor pieces just have a lot of mobility. So those were his options. A6, B6, and Bishop takes. But my opponent plays King B8. And that loses to Bishop E5 check, which is the only move. Bishop E5 check. Because the King is under attack. And if it goes to A8, then Knight C7 check. I'm not just winning the rook because this comes with check. Like, it's a discovered check. So I'm not even just winning the exchange. I'm just winning a whole rook. If he goes back there, I can continue the windmill and play like this and win the queen. And if he goes to c8, then the knight just escapes via f6. And I've got three minor pieces and a rook for a queen, which is obviously winning. That's way too much material. So he has to go to c8, and knight takes a7 check is the logical follow-up. 
Now you could be asking why not knight d6, but that just loses two pieces for a rook, which is a bad trade. So knight takes a7. King d7 is the only move because this bishop cuts off b8. And the computer didn't really like taking the bishop. It wanted moves like d4 to try and open up the d-file, which in retrospect, I maybe should have seen. But I thought this was clever because he can't take with the king because then I'm going to win the rook. So he has to take with the pawn and he's ruined his structure. Here, again, d4 is probably the move to force the file open. Uh, but I play knight c3 because I'm like, look, bro, your pawn's hanging. Also, bear in mind, I've got 30 seconds, so I'm not playing perfectly. He goes rook a8. Uh, it's, it's an odd move, but this pawn is a problem. Because had in this position I played a5 and then a6, it's very well defended by my bishop. The bishop can't be kicked by any pawns because there's no pawns on the B or D file for my opponent. And it's two squares away from queening. So my opponent stops that with rook a8 because I don't control the a5 square so I can't get it to a6. I take the pawn. King c8. I am threatening knight to f6 check picking up the rook. I don't actually know how black stops that. I'm also threatening the g5 pawn. Computer wants queen f7. And if I go here, it just wants to give the rook up. Although, the computer prefers I take the pawn rather than the rook. Which is kind of wild. But I, I play this logically. I'm just like, look, you're going to give me the exchange. I'm going to take the exchange. And then we're going to open up all the lines. Because I now have two bishops and a rook for a queen. And say I had like a bishop and a knight and a rook for a queen. I'm still winning. But it's not as easy. But with a bishop pair. Like they are absolutely killer. Like they're just controlling so many squares. They're also blocking black from advancing his pawns. So he can't even open up lines against my king. And this bishop obviously controls a really important um diagonal so we have h6 because if he takes here then i'm winning a rook so he can't do that so he just defends and then i take take and play rook h1 and go okay i can't open the g file but now the h file's open so king d7 is played to stop rook h8 coming with a check and picking the rook up and i go d4 which I should have maybe played like 10 moves ago, but it's the best move in this position. Because where does the king go? Where does the king go? Say black plays a move like f3. I'm taking here. The king's forced to the back rank. And this is miserable. Like, I could just do something simple like trade the rooks. And <clears throat> I have way too many pieces. I'm probably going to bring this bishop back to g3, stop the advancement. These uh, the, the pawn protects the bishop, the bishop protects the pawn. The queen can take on c5, so I'll probably play a move like rook d6, which isn't best, but I'm going to pick up all these pawns, and there's no risk in the position. My opponent plays king c8 immediately, which just allows the same sort of thing. And I go a4 takes i take back with the bishop i don't take with the rook because here i'm going to lose my past pawn so if i take with the bishop wait can he not just do the same thing yeah he can <laughs> he can <laughs> it didn't make a difference um yeah no i just missed that i guess but i had 14 seconds so you can forgive me G4 is apparently better anyway, just trying to create a pass pawn. And I go a6. Now the pawn is protected by the bishop. The bishop is protected by the pawn. And the pawn's protected by the bishop. So, you know, these pieces aren't going anywhere. And I also control the a7 square. We have g3, takes, takes. And I'm not worried about his pass pawn because I have two pieces controlling g1. 
and here I just put my bishop on g1. The computer doesn't like it, but I'm like, look, this pawn is never moving. My opponent should play c5 here to cut off the connection between my bishop and the pawn, and I can't actually defend this pawn anymore, which we both missed. But here I have moves like rook e1 and whoa, bishop b5 check. That is cool. <laughs> that is very cool. <laughs> Only an engine sees that. Okay. But queen g5 check. I move my king. He goes to a5. I play bishop takes e6 because the pawn's hanging. Like, there's nothing he can do about it. And the queen has to keep an eye on d1 because otherwise my rook's coming in and I'm promoting. And he plays queen b6, which just hangs a queen. So I take it and my opponent resigns. And that's the game. It was kind of mad. Like, I think this is a legitimate line that can be played. Like, from here, the computer doesn't like g4. And I've had these kinds of lines quite a few times where the knight comes in with tempo. And I think, I think this, although the computer says it's better for black, I think it's way easier to play with white. Again, it's a queen and two pawns for a bishop and two knights. But with so many pieces on the board and my king being so safe, I think the three minor pieces are probably better than the queen. Especially because this bishop's unopposed and my opponent's got so many pawns on light squares. F5 is probably going to have to be played as well, like it did in the game. And this bishop is very, very strong, which is what won, it's, um, what won me the game. This bishop e5 was played and the bishop was just way too strong. My opponent didn't have a counter to it because he doesn't have his dark squared bishop. So I'd recommend you guys looking into this line if you plan on playing the um, Papaticulat Gambit is what it's officially called. God knows why. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend looking into this line because while the computer may not fully approve of it, I think it's probably really, really interesting and very winnable with white. Even in a classical game, I reckon it would be good. So, yeah. I'll stop waffling on. That's the video. If you've watched till the end, then um, God bless you. Much appreciated. And um, I'll see you in the next one.